Hi, it's Pastor Utton. As you can tell, we're not at Trinity today. The executive team at Trinity decided it would be safer for everyone to just stay home this Sunday as the roads will likely be too dangerous to drive. So instead, I have provided a brief service that I've recorded at my home. The service is based off the bulletin that was prepared for this Sunday. Thank you, Anne and everyone else. And I pray that you are blessed by the reception of it. We begin today's service in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth of God is not within us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We spend a moment to reflect on our need for our Savior and for His forgiveness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us. Renew us and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Receive this good news. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The intro today is this. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord, that he look down from his holy height. From the heaven the Lord looked at the earth, to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free those who are doomed to die, that they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord, and in Jerusalem his praise, when peoples gather together and kingdoms to worship the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and stretch forth the hand of your majesty to heal and defend us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament lesson today is taken from Nehemiah, the 8th chapter. All the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard, on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. 
They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with the gradual. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love towards us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. The epistle today is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For just as the body is one, and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews and Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, Where would the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each of them as he chose. If we're all a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. For if one member suffers, all suffer together. And if one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As it was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. 
And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town, and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you today. Well, I have some great news as you experienced yesterday. It's great news for kids who are young and kids who are old. We had snow. It is joy to the student. It is joy to the teacher. It snowed. Now, I grew up with snow. I'm not sure how many of you did, but I grew up with snow and all the snow activities. For you see, I lived in Vermont, about 30 minutes south of Canada, and we got the cold, we got the snow, but we got all the fun stuff that comes with, with snowing. From the sledding, to the skating, to the skiing, to the cross-country skiing, to the uh, snow shoe walking, and just getting outside, enjoying God's creation in the snow. It's something my kids who have lived their entire lives here in Hampton Roads have really not experienced very much. My wife and I have this philosophy. If it's going to be cold, you know what? It might as well snow. And I'm so glad it snowed for everyone is enjoying this snow that has landed for us all. Now for my wife who grew up in Florida, her first time experiencing snow was actually in Russia when she did a missions trip. And Stacy's mom, who also lived in Florida her entire life, experienced snow for the first time when my wife and I lived near Boston, and she came up and visited us during the Christmas season. <laughs> There's so much fun you can have in the snow. Now, everyone that you know has taken pictures, have been outside maybe making snowmen or having snowball fights, making finding hills, although there aren't very many around here, sadly, but maybe going sledding and having some fun. It is such a real treat, isn't it? So since snow doesn't happen here much at all, I thought snow would be a great centerpiece today's sermon. For just like many things in nature, we learn a lot about God and his nature through his creation. So I want to make three points that we can learn about snow and more than likely about the nature of God and his love for me and for you. First of all, the snow, the snowflake is beautiful. It is intricate. It is unique. In Vermont, there was a gentleman named Snowflake Bentley and he was born, I'd say about 150 years ago. And he had this, desire upon his heart to take pictures of snowflakes because he was so amazed and enthralled by the beauty and the uniqueness of them. And there have been books written about him. He created books himself, even coffee table sized books with thousands of pictures of snowflakes that he did not for 10 years or 20 years, but for 40 years of his life. He actually died in the snow taking pictures of snowflakes. That's how important the uniqueness and catching the beauty of the snowflake was to him. Now, for this snowflake Bentley, he was a man of faith. 
When he was asked about his interest in snow, he answered this. Snowflakes were a miracle of beauty. And it seemed to be a shame that this beauty should not be seen and appreciated by others. Every crystal was a masterpiece of design. And no single design that he saw was ever repeated. For you see, for this snowflake Bentley, he saw the story of the great designer, the great creator within this snowflake. His work has inspired many a sermon. One example is below. In 1925, Bentley said this, Under the microscope, every crystal was a masterpiece of design, and no one design was ever repeated. And for you see, that example is perfect. For today we learn about, in 1 Corinthians, about the uniqueness of our gifts. That my gift is different than your gift. Your gift is different than the person next to you, even the different people at home. You are made unique and special. You are created in a way that you have these gifts intrinsically in you that God placed in you for you to use for the kingdom of God. And it doesn't matter that your gift is different or that someone may have a better gift because that does not exist. You are made beautifully by God to be who you are, not just in, in shape and form, but in talent and gifts. So hold on to the fact that we have a God who created something small and detailed and so beautiful and detailed as a snowflake. Just think how much more, how so much more we are made unique and beautiful because we are God's creation. Now, the second thing that snow reminds us is this. It's white. Not just grayish white. Not just an off white or an eggshell white. It is what? Pure white. It is not a covering. It is not a dye. It is not a trick. When we see a, a scene of the snow that has fallen and landed on everything, the word that we use is pristine. And the definition of pristine is this, having its original purity. It's uncorrupted. It is unsullied. And you know what? Have you ever been out to a landscape or out to the field, out somewhere where no one has touched the snow yet? You know what I mean. It's perfect. It is beautiful. It is beautifully white. Before the cars come, before the plows come, before it turns into slush, which before all the animals get to it, it's so scenic and perfect. It is scenic and perfect because it's all covered up. It is not sullied. <laughs> it, is not, it is not dirty in any shape or form. It is not old. It is not imperfect. It's covered up all the dirty fields. It's covered up all the messy stuff. And for a moment, the snow reminds us that our normal life is covered up also. For you see, in this image of snow, in the perfection of snow, in the whiteness of snow, we are reminded that we have a God who loves us so much that he takes our imperfections, our sullenness, our brokenness, our, our dirtiness, our, our junk, our sin, and what does he do with it? He makes it as white as snow. It's not covering it up. It's not a, a sort of going on top of it. It is removing our sin, which was our brokenness, our hurt, our pain, our struggles, and makes it white as snow. My friends, the, the prophet Isaiah Use this image for snow. Though your sins are like scarlet, your sins shall be as white as snow. For you see, God has taken us and not just covered up our sin, not just hid our sin, but has removed the redness, the brokenness, the hurt, the obviousness of the sin, and made us holy 
and white and beautiful in the eyes of God. And we thank you for allowing Jesus to take away our sins so that we may be seen as white as snow by our holy, holy God. And it's nothing of our own doing. We can't just change out our own sin and to change out our own soliness, our own dirtiness. We can't do that and, and force ourselves to be white. It is only through the blood of Christ, his sacrifice, his great work on the cross, that great exchange that we are made white as snow. And how beautiful that is. So every time that you see snow and the beauty of it and the pristineness of it, remember this fact. You are that pristine also because of the love of God that sent Jesus on the cross so that you might receive his forgiveness that makes you white as snow, not just a day, but every single day. What a joy that is. So the last thing I want to talk to you about snow today is this. Snow is bright. For you see, a phenomenon that happens after the storm. After the storm clouds pass by, the sun comes out and shines on the snow and reflects its brilliance everywhere and is so incredibly bright. There's a term that they will use called you are snow blind. For sometimes it is so bright that you need goggles or glasses just to make sure that you can walk in the direction of the sun. And the truth is this. For as bright as the sun is when it shines on the snow, so much brighter is the Son of God when He returns in His full glory. There is no comparison to the brightness of the Son of God to the brightness of the sun that is shining upon the snow. For when the Son of God comes, and there will be no doubt for it, He will push away all the darkness. All the darkness of the world will be removed when the Son of God comes in His fullness and in His glory. John, in his revelation, tells us this. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sh sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid, for I am the first, I am the last, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look. I'm alive forever and ever. For you see, when Jesus returns, there will be no doubt. For his brightness, his glory will be brighter than anything that this world has ever experienced. Even the brightest reflection of the sun reflecting on the snow. So great is his brightness when he returns. So in conclusion, I hope you are reminded of three things about us that we have learned through this snow. One is that as unique and detailed and beautiful each snowflake is, so much greater is your uniqueness and gifts to this world for God loves and created you for who you are. The second thing is this, that we are made white, white as snow through the work and love of Christ upon the cross for our lives and for our eternity and we are made white every single day. And lastly, as great as the brightness is when the sun reflects on the snow, so great is the brightness of Christ in his glorious return when he comes back that will shine and push away all the darkness of the entire world. And yes, I am thankful for the snow and the fun me and my family have had in it, and I hope yours also. But more than that, I pray that through the snow we have learned more about God and his love for me and you and his creation. To this, the people of God say, Amen. And now, let us confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let us go now to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. O Lord, your servant Joseph endured hardship and struggle, yet believed it would come to good. Give us such tested faith, and bring all things to completion according to your purposes in Christ, the new Adam, who has brought hope to the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lead all pastors, missionaries, and church workers in faithful service to your people with compassion and love. Bless every place where we hear your word and serve our neighbor in Christ's name. Lord, in your mercy, hear your prayer. Let your love have its way with us, Lord. Lead us to expect no self-interest reward, but to love our enemies and serve those in need. Put an end to all bitterness and strife. Let forgiveness reign between each of us, even as Christ's blood covers our sins before your heavenly throne. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort all who suffer, deliver the sick according to your will, and sustain by your grace those who are troubled in body or soul, especially those we name before you now. Be with the dying and grant them peace at the last. Give your comfort to those who grieve, and grant your children patience and courage to endure every time of trial with hope in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, I pray that this service has blessed you, and I pray also for safe travels as you go out into the world after this snow. Now receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, lift his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So go now in peace to serve our Lord. Thanks be to God.